starting back up on the bottom of page 81. Seems like he's getting ready to <clears throat> constantly refer to the nature versus nurture argument. Basically saying that both exist. It's, it's not what he's saying, but that's what I'm taking from it. Like, education as the practice of freedom denies that man is abstract, isolated, independent, and unattached to the world. It also denies that the world exists as a reality apart from people. I do think this is the main thing that school does wrong, which is that it makes the world abstract. And it does so by, in my opinion, removing kids from it. <laughs> That's like <clears throat> the very fact that they're not a part of the world. They're, they're, they're in a school. Uh, I, I think this is kind of part of how you can abstract it. You can make something like that abstract. If you're never really in it, then you don't understand it. Isolation. Cloistering. This is an interesting claim on top of page 82. It's like quoting a, uh, a, quoting a, a, a peasant who by banking standards was completely ignorant. Basically just meaning some, like, random hillbilly. Now I see that without man, there is no world. <laughs> when the educator responded, let's say, for the sake of argument, that all the men on the earth were to die, but the earth itself remained, together with trees, birds, animals, rivers, seas, the stars. Wouldn't all this be a world? Oh no, the peasant replied emphatically. There would be no one to say, this is a world. Well, you know what's fascinating about this is that, like, the quote comes from a, a peasant out of Chile. And South America was called by the Europeans the New World, or rather it was part of the New World. The indication being a dehumanization of the people who had already discovered it. It becomes a world through discovery. And for them, it was a new world. Uh, but it was not itself new because there were already people who were there and it was old to them but i think their reference is more to the discovery that we make what is and what is is what we make the idea that man is not separate from the world and that the world in a sense depends upon man in a in a very abstract sense this is true um uh, this this kind of goes into my whole abstraction plus nuance kind of annoys me, but I, I can at least follow this. I still don't like the the description. Maybe it's just a translation problem, but he keeps saying problem posing education, and like my problem is that when I hear problem posing, it just still sounds like there's uh, some kind of an agenda that is privileged by the posing. It's... I, the problem is, like I, like I said, I'm trying to single out exactly why the so-called followers of this guy were not uh, happy with the Sudbury model. And I, I'm still trying to figure that out. That's still the problem in the back of my head. I'm, I'm trying to read more of how he describes this education, and problem posing still has an actor and an acted upon. And for all the language he's using, I, I don't see that ha as being fundamentally different. There's still the teacher doing the thing, and the teacher and the student having the thing be done to them. It, there, there's something in this that it is reminding me of. A description I heard of of the problems of that the early social reformers in pre-revolutionary Russia were having, which was that the peasants uh, were interested in reading, learning to read. Right? Then, once they learned to read, the social reformers were frustrated at the fact that all they wanted to do was like read novels, like like Moby Dick or or, or just fictional stuff. They didn't want to get interested in politics just because they knew how to read. And this was like a source of frustration for the people who wished to take what the peasants had and 
somehow expanded into the broader political sphere above their own. There, there, there's still this presumption of the student in need. It, it's just a different way of looking at the same fundamental assumption that, that the student is the one who needs, uh, the teacher is the one who helps. And like, I'm not even necessarily going against this, but he's just trying to paint it as like so fundamentally different. And it's just not, I'm just not seeing it yet. I'm seeing and I'm hearing that like, you know, learning to read is not enough. It's like, no, 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 you got to pose problems to them. You're like, like, <laughs> you got to get them interested in politics or something like that. Y you know, because like, oh, now that I know how to read, let me just, you know, ooh, Tolkien, mm, you know, ooh, ooh Dostoevsky, mm, you know, like, no, no, that's you don't, not like that, though. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's like, it's like this, this lady uh, on the YouTubes, is trying to promote being a traditional wife and they're making fun of feminists you know in the comment section like women should be able to do whatever they want but not like that <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of getting a sense that this is what's happening here there's a little bit of this going on I, I, I just don't like the way he uses this word on the bottom of page 84 which engages people as beings aware of their incompletion. I don't... I, just, I don't like that. I don't like that phrasing. I don't like that phrasing because my, my whole thing is that what I like to say, and I think a lot of people can relate to this, is that like when it comes to people's inherent strengths, you don't have to do anything. They're already strong. It's people who are blind to their weaknesses that need help and the easiest way to explain that is it's like you know like in sports you know or athletics where it's like he's already good at xyz his problem is abc and this is what a coach perceives and figures out a, a training regimen to help you with your blind spots i mean that's the definition of a blind spot you know you're really good over here, but you got to remember this. you got to remember that. Introducing the mind into an equation that is otherwise intuitive. Now, what I just said is not about incompleteness. <laughs> it's about, like, an area undeveloped. I, I wouldn't call a person incomplete. Uh, I would call them imbalanced. And imbalanced by the standard of, like, you know excellence like really you know somebody who who does well you know what i have in my mind what i have in my mind is like fighting like direct you know combat in a one-to-one -one sense that like the person who generally wins you know they, they may be extreme in certain regards as unique to their character but like you you don't get to a very high level except that you've learn to compensate for the natural weaknesses that, that come with what you do. You know, it's like covering your bases. You know, that we just have a lot of expressions for not incompleteness, but for, like, the things that don't come as easily to somebody with a recognition that there are many things that do come easily to people. And you, there's usually an understandable relationship between the two. You know, one who acts before thinking... Uh, their their problem is, as I just described, versus one who thinks too much and doesn't act. Self-evident, self-contained. I, I, you've identified the problem by stating it. This idea of incompletion. I don't like it. It's rubbing me the wrong way. Page 85 the banking method directly or indirectly reinforces men's fatalistic perception of their situation. The problem-posing method presents this very situation to them as a problem. The problem-posing method presents this very situation to them as a problem. 
This almost sounds like the Sudbury model, except that the context is that there, there appears to be, like I said, there's a problem posing. The very idea of the Sudbury model is it's just, just freedom, just straight up as much as can be granted unbridled freedom without any obvious problem. If somebody runs into a, a limit to what it is that they can do, then their goal would be to give themselves the task of figuring out how to solve that problem, which is what the democratic process is about. That's where suggesting things to, to bring up during family, not family, I do family meeting at my house, but like in a, in a school meeting at a Sudbury, it's like, hey, I want to do X, Y, Z, uh, but we don't have the stuff or nobody else wants to do X, Y, Z. Like, how can we make such and such happen? So I'm, I'm, I'm hearing the outcome cognitively of what's being described on page 85, but I'm not hearing the context. It, I'm, I'm hearing, uh, you know, again, a, a, an intended program with a certain kind of outcome. The outcome being a self-aware person acting with their self-awareness. But I'm not convinced as to the efficacy of the method. Because I haven't even really heard a, a method. I've just heard the idea of posing a problem, beginning a conversation. And it's like, that's just... There's so much more to life than talk. I don't know why this is getting the priority that it does. I, I think it relates to the fact that there's so much of education is considered intellectual. And it's like, that's just not friggin' true. It's like, why the heck would mental health benefit so much from physical exercise if the intellect was... Like, it doesn't make any sense. Like, the, the human being is one total being. And, and like... Excelling physically helps you mentally. Now, it may not be an obvious connection, at least it's from like an IQ perspective or, or however the hell people feel like defining intelligence, but this idea that school and our narrow definition of intelligence, which precludes physical capacity, I guess, he, he, he's working with this stupid... Because I, I really hate the idea that... In, I feel like the word smart is such a limited and narrow word that refers to like a very small portion of the human experience. And there's just so much more going on with a human than smartness. This is where you get into the whole different kinds of smartness. This, people bring this up because of the problem that like, just because you can't perceive it as smart doesn't mean it isn't there. This is that thing that, like, Temple Grandin talks about a lot. Like, like these people who, like, they have no math ability at all, but as far as, like, being mechanics and having, like, patents, you know, to their name, like, these people are exceptional geniuses. They just not... It's just not a verbal kind of intelligence. It's an unconscious kind that, that comes out through action, through perception, not uh, through frickin' SAT scores or whatever. And, and he's, the concept of, edu of intelligence, the concept of education he's working with seems to be of the intellectual variety, which is, just, which is just wrong. There's so many people who don't fit into that mold for whom this kind of education wouldn't, uh, like, problem posing. It's like, look, if people can perceive the world... I don't know that he's giving people the credit to do this. But that's where I... But like I, I'm partisan here. I, I think that given enough time and freedom and opportunity, people will perceive what is in their way, and they'll either solve it, or, you know, if they can't solve it themselves, they'll <laughs> ask their peers, work together. You know, I got such and such problem. You know, and there's a conversational aspect there, but it's like... The conversation is on the back of experience, you know. 
it's what you bring to the conversation that matters. Not 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 that somebody started a conversation. I don't just this is this overly overemphasized role of the teacher is something he seems to be caught up in. The the excessive importance of the teacher. And I say excessive. I don't say the teacher has no importance. I say that excessive importance. Like the student doesn't get anywhere without him. That's just not that's just not how life works. I think I'm starting to see more. The, the bottom of page 85 seems to put it together, I think. The pursuit of full humanity cannot be carried out in isolation or individualism, but only in fellowship and solidarity. Therefore, no one can be authentically human while he prevents others from being so. Who's preventing who? Like, like this? He, he's trying to equate individualism as being opposed to other people. He says, attempting to be more human individualistically leads to having more egotistically which is a form of dehumanization. This seems weird and wrong. Like, if somebody uh, gets somewhere meaningful or useful from some starting point of, of being in need, you know, and they exceed as an individual, like, how is that a problem? I don't understand. Like, by definition, somebody like this has an ego. Well, what, what if that ego recognizes all the people who help them? I mean, so many people, like, at, at their time of, of triumph or victory are, are thanking all the people they couldn't have done it without. I mean, I guess not everybody does that. Sure, but, like... To, to say that that always is what happens. He's trying to speak against the famine mentality while I think just, just, just suggesting that we have a famine mentality. This is, this is like what Joe Rogan talks about so much and, and, or the people at breaking points. It's like the idea that everybody's in competition with each other for a limited number of resources, that's the famine mentality. As opposed to, like, I'm going to have you on my show, and now people know about you because of my show. I grew your audience by introducing my audience to your audience, and together we all help and grow. I don't see that that is dehumanization at any level. It seems to be one where, like, the potentially interested are have a means of becoming exposed to different things. That's what that's what Joe Rogan does. He has a whole bunch of different people on on his show, and some will tune into certain episodes and not others. And that's because he does not have a famine mentality. He has a feast mentality. It's like yeah, people are going to tune into whatever they want to tune into. He's just doing what he wants, and people happen to be tuning in. I, I don't agree with this zero-sum mentality that for somebody to excel as an individual harms the group. That just doesn't seem right, and that's kind of what's... That just seems like what he's, he's trying to imply here. I mean, in certain things there are competition, and like... Competition, as far as I'm concerned, you know, is is all well and good in certain contexts, but there are certain contexts where competition is a bad thing. But, um, I just, uh, this doesn't, this... I'm starting to think that these, these leftists oppose individualism, like any manifestation of individualism. Solidarity fellowship these are what gives a person meaning the, the the way that they participate in a larger whole i don't think it needs to be an either or i mean i don't think there's anything pretty 
difficult to understand about the media ecosystem and how Joe Rogan participates in it versus corporate people and how they participate in it. Like, I I don't think that these this, this, this guy is... He's just He doesn't seem like he's right about this. I know there's a lot of people that be mad about, like, not being on Joe Rogan, and he is uh, hogging all the attention, therefore they can't get it, which is, like, a really weird way to look at somebody who just puts stuff out there. And, like, okay, yeah, the algorithm... But then blame the algorithm. Did Joe Rogan make the algorithm? No. And like, just it's 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 so. But this is this is how people think, though. This is this is people who aren't relevant will have problems with those who are relevant. I myself have this problem. That's why I'm I'm intending on publishing this stuff because I don't know. Maybe somebody's interested in it. To anybody out there, hey. Good to, good to meet you. Did we just become best friends? Maybe. I don't know. His use of the word revolutionary continues to just make me think of America. A revolutionary society. I wonder if he includes America in revolutionary society. Or maybe he doesn't because the form of our revolution is different than his vision. I don't know. But... Either way, I'm starting chapter 3 now because I don't really care. Top of page 88 seems like an interesting way to describe and think about the problem of uh, like lobbying and interest groups. I think, <laughs> I wonder if the pursuit of interest is something that is considered problematic related to this same logic. If action is emphasized exclusively to the detriment of reflection, the word is converted into activism. I think, I mean, this does sound like what, this is the common criticism levied upon, like, racial activists of today, which is that, like, they become increasingly focused on more minute aspects of the problem because the major problems are becoming less. This is an interesting way of dismissal, but I, I think what, what's implied by this is an accurate problem, which is that the interest group has the group as part of its interest. The idea that uh, something be achieved uh, would mean the end of relevance for the interest group. This is kind of the problem of activism. Activism, it, it never ends. This is like what Reagan said about government itself. It's like government never voluntarily reduces its, its scope or its size. Uh, I would argue that, you know, political activism is, is very much the same. This is like the problem with political parties. It's like, how does a political party have a conversation with itself? And it's like, well, theoretically, they're always having a conversation with themselves, except that there's this interesting selection bias of who is in the conversation, who has showed up, who has left, who has not left. This is what we say about echo chambers. Interest groups, echo, cha echo chambers. Seems like kind of a weird way to look at it, but then I feel like if I if I throw this out, I have to kind of throw it all out. Like like Reagan is wrong, you know. So are the activists. I guess I look at it more as like the the logical transition from anarchism to establishment, which is that like once we start doing anything because it works or whatever reason, it becomes established. And then itself becomes a part of the rules that govern. Uh, that's what custom is. You don't go against it because it's custom. And why is it custom? Well, at some point it worked. You know, and then changing customs can be extremely hard once they are established. This to me is why the, the anarchists are, are excessively dreamery. They identify with the part 
of history where a nation grows and inevitably nations stagnate and fall. It seems pretty inevitable that this happens. And uh, the anarchist likes the part where things are being built, but they don't like the part where things are established. The, th uh, the thing is, I reflect upon this as an individual. I, uh, I work out routines in my life that make sense for me to get each and every one of my individual needs organized, prioritized, and dealt with according to its importance. I, I've dedicated one day a week to this, this reading process that I'm doing, this, this podcast I'm trying to produce, because the whole rest of my time is taken up with my personal, physical, mental health, which is all kind of one picture anyway. And that, again, serves a greater purpose of making sure that I can function, survive, and live, and be a breadwinner for the family, and to be active uh, and participatory with the family. I, I'm a member of this family, and as far as priorities are concerned, you know, I've, I've ordered them. And I'm open to reordering them. As an individual, I, I think the, the problem is that society tends to include a lot of people who don't like reordering. Um, but then this is where my preference would then be for the side of reform rather than the side of revolution. Because for anything that gets established, it takes so long to get established that like, you should just take it as and be grateful for the good parts of what were established. And any new thing that is to be established may very well take as long as the original thing that you might want to destroy in a revolution, but you may destroy some other stuff along the way. But my, my, uh, where I do agree with the anarchists is that activism usually is a call for other people to do things. Uh, which I think has the problem of increasing and exacerbating the existing problematic power dynamics. Uh, I like the axiom, ask forgiveness, not permission, which I think goes in line with anarchist thinking, that if there really is something new that needs to be established, or something problematic that is established, do as much as you can to directly compete against it, and take it down dialogically. You know, like if paying your workers well makes a better business, you know, then like just do it, like just do it and show everybody how it's done and make all of your competitors look bad. I mean, just, you know what I mean? Like this isn't to say I'm not sympathetic to people who, who lobby for, for higher wages and better working conditions. Those are often, you know, needed. And that's a rightful complaint to make. There's also something to be said for just leaving and doing it on your own. You know, and then the only question is the, the, the relative level of difficulty. Hmm. I think there's a matter of just weighing the odds and going with the decision that is most likely to produce the best outcome, perhaps in the shortest amount of time. But uh, sometimes it's better to play the long game, even though nobody's going to be taking Amazon down soon. It's not like Amazon's going to be here forever. So when they go away, who will replace them? Maybe your irrelevant shop nobody knows about right now, but give it a cup, <laughs> give it enough time. I, it's hard for people to believe in stuff like that, though, even though it seems to really accurately summarize <laughs> history. I'm reflecting upon page 89 about how no matter where the oppressed are found, this act of love is commitment to their cause, the cause of liberation. And this commitment, because it is loving, is dialogical. I'm just remembering this video of this homeless guy sitting on a recliner on the street. And the guy is like, why are you living like this? He's like, because I like it. He's like, 
you, you should want better for yourself. And he's like, why? I like it here. I have what I want. This seems kind of like what he's <laughs> he's been describing. Like the... <laughs> this, is what's, this is what's funny. And it's like... Domination reveals the pathology of love. Sadism in the dominator and masochism in the dominated. So I guess in the dialogue with this homeless man just chilling, he would say, no, this guy is a masochist, and there is a pathology here. <laughs> but it's like, why would you not trust the dude who says, no, I just like, I just like sitting here all day. <laughs> I mean, I kind of doubt that he likes sitting there all day, but if he does, what are we supposed to do? <laughs> Is that, like, legitimately a problem that you'd blame on society? I mean, it seems to be a decision that he's made to sit there all day. Okay. It must not serve as a pretext for manipulation. It must generate other acts of freedom. Otherwise, it is not love. Well, gee. Like, he's trying to define what like a lack of freedom is while insisting that like just I mean just let people make decisions <laughs> doesn't that include decisions you don't identify with like like if, if that dude on his couch I guess we have to talk to him in such a way that he becomes more free even though I guess I mean he seems pretty free <laughs> already <laughs> He's he's very much chosen to sit on his recliner on the street. So we got to abolish oppression. Uh, again, who defines oppression? Is this guy defining oppression? Is the is the guy on the couch oppressed? Is the I mean really, is the dude sitting on a on a recliner on the street is he oppressed? And, and like, but then what is the definition of oppression? Is, is it like when you're, when somebody's making you do what you don't want? Or is it you deciding to do what you do want? I mean, you, you see that they're in a self-imposed prison. So what's the frickin', what's the definition? I mean, like, there's no criteria that he's referring to at all. Just, just to, just innuendo and I think he's relying on we the audience to kind of see where he's coming from but I'm a, I'm a cantankerous audience I guess I don't know it's like there's a set of positive and negative traits that is just he's just saying they're positive and negative no, no not even going into any kind of detail or here's an exception to the rule he's just trying to come up with rules this is this has always been my problem with philosophers because like are are you contributing to an ongoing conversation or are you trying to just be a prophet because like when you're trying to be a prophet you're just declaring values and then you either have followers or you don't <laughs> and, and like proving your values is the job of your words and then like i said you either have a following or you don't and i just i don't follow philosophers i'm participating in an ongoing conversation that's that's the way i see what i'm doing and i feel like this dude is coming from a place that i don't freaking agree with one of the things that i like about islam is a concrete objective set list of things that are problemat that are actually specifically problems and i don't see sitting on a couch as being you know uh, theoretically it's illegal you know like i don't you know well we should obey laws <laughs> so yeah i'm judging his just complete personal philosophy off of like yeah, it's just your personal philosophy. Who the hell are you, Paulo Freire? Oh, 
Okay, Paulo Freire. Good, yeah, good set of ideas, I guess. I don't care. I'm not a believer in you. I feel like page 90 describes perfectly the way that I see the problem with the Muslims these days, which is that, like, I have seen by interacting with the scholars of Islam, those who have really studied uh, the religion, that they are intellectually served greatly by this study. It's not that they are all super intelligent, but they know how to think methodically. And they do this because they're participants in an ongoing transmission. Yeah, it's transmission. But there's a lot of interaction built into it. There's a lot of acquiring basic logic and incorporating that logic into understanding what it is that we believe. The idea of turning your belief into something of a system is what we would call in Islam fiqh. And the people who learn this are unfortunately few in number relative to the whole. And as a result, we have people who are kind of like way far ahead in the book and a whole bunch of people who cannot read it. And as far as I can tell, there's an unfortunate gap between the people who are ignorant and the people who do actually know. And this gap is perpetuating the problem he describes, which is that there's a kind of unreasonable classism that can exist between these two groups uh, to the extent that these two groups exist. And in, in the world of the Muslims, it seems like they do. And uh, I think there may be problematic behaviors that are coming along with it. Uh, partisans uh, of, of certain people, not educated not uh, independent, but merely uh, owing allegiance to some faction, not a participant. And it's, it's really a big problem, because as far as understanding the world is concerned, I don't see any better system for it than Islam. And the system has an educational process, and so few Muslims go through that process. So then we have people who just kind of believe something of whatever they want to or whatever they're interested in and they persist in their ignorance. Now this is not super problematic, but there is nothing beneficial about ignorance. And this is not me being even that philosophical about it, but it's like you can't really act properly without proper knowledge. I mean, one sort of precedes the other. Like we earlier I said, mindlessness is action without thought. So like, does it serve people to be ignorant and live their lives in ignorance? I feel like that's a self-evident claim. But then I'm also kind of defining knowledge as knowledge of Islam, but that's because... You know, especially going off the backs of my last complaint about Freire and his reference to humility and dialogue. And, and, and I just feel like he doesn't have solid definitions for these. The problem, as I've explained to at least a couple of Muslims, is that I can, like, read a, a legal opinion from a scholar... But I don't necessarily become educated by reading the legal opinion. Uh, it, it's a, there's an unequivalency to the exchange that frustrates me um, due to the fact that there's just not, at least it seems to be, not the same level of productivity as there used to be. And I'm sure there's a number of reasons why that's true. You might call them excuses, depending on your predisposition. My hope would be to help the Muslim scholars figure out how better to serve their interests of continuing to be what are essentially just nerds. Uh, how, how can they better serve their interest in being nerds while at the same time serve a, a bunch of ignorant people who would prefer to have more knowledge than they do? I, I don't see that there's much of a solution that's been presented. 
other than you have to become one of them the way that they've become themselves, which seems to be like, psh, but not everybody's going to nerd out <laughs> and, and go through the years, the years and years of effort. It's it, what I find interesting is what, what Sheikh Amr Saeed was saying today, or what I was listening to today. I'm reminded of what I'm reading about on page 91, which is that you just, you just, not that Islam is about democracy exactly, but to glorify democracy and to silence the people is a farce. To discourse on humanism and to negate people is a lie. He, he, Sheikh Amr was saying that basically there wasn't any question that the Prophet ever shied away from. Everybody was welcome to say whatever they wanted, and the prophet would then respond accordingly. And this was part of the process of teaching them Islam. Theoretically, there's a power dynamic. He's the, he's the responder. Well, that's the whole thing. He's the responder. As far as I'm aware, I mean, my, in my familiarity with the concept of democratic education as advanced by the Sudbury the Valley School, it seems that responsiveness is the main is the main goal. The idea that people get elected to staff and re-elected by effectively responding to the needs of the kids and so the needs and so the kids will re-elect them because the staff is seen to be useful. The idea that you know like <laughs> What I've heard at least one scholar complain about is that people have so many questions. They have so many questions and really complex questions. And they're constantly putting all of these questions to the few people who, who don't even claim that they have as much knowledge as they would like. This is where I've, I've wanted to try to step in and be like, do you guys not understand that like, having students is one of the best ways to learn and like the only way you can actually learn on a regular basis is to have students yet uh, how have you organized these schools of yours have you organized them on the assumption that you are the knower and you've given a structure that relies upon you that creates the problem that if knowledge is broadcast then there is no dialogue to help the, the, the discovery go on. People need to participate in your studies as, like, you know, people who are mutually interested in the same things. The idea that you would incorporate other people in the process of studying it seems to be like what a lot of these people would actually want. And instead they're kind of stuck with this old... I would argue outdated structure of just straight up transmission from one generation to the next. And like I've said, that transmission alone has quite a bit of power, but there's just something missing. The, the, the heights of scholarship seem low, and it seems because too many people depend upon too few people who themselves have too little knowledge by their own admission. I sit here in my basement just hoping I can somehow find a way to help people to think differently about the, the things that they do in their lives. And I think some restructuring is in order. But I don't, I'm not a revolutionary, I'm a reformer. I think that what we've built can simply be reconceived of, redesigned and modified, but some something more fundamental, though. Something in between reform and revolution. Something like the Sudbury model. You know, theoretically it's not for everyone, which I disagree with, but I also, as I believe in, you know, the right of people to make decisions for themselves, have the option available on the free market. <laughs> and we'll see how they fare in the long term. And see, you know, if something never goes to market, people can't choose it. And so I'm trying to put ideas out there that I feel like are not represented in the marketplace in hopes that somebody may choose it. That's as much as I can do.